trouble. We got trouble. We got trouble right here in River City. And we need God to come right into our life and change it. This is a story filled with problems, filled with trouble. Let's get to God's answer. My name is Father Mike Manning. I'm a Catholic priest. I'm coming to you with God's great love for you. God entering into all the things that are going on in your life and bringing power and promise and hope. I'm believing that God loves you, and I believe that God loves me, and that's the motivation for me standing in front of you and trying to tell you all these things about the power of strength of God turning your life upside down. Now, uh, what I want to do is I want to be able to share with you God's message as it comes to us from the Bible. Uh, I believe that the Bible is a beautiful story of people who uh, run into terrible, terrible problems. And God enters into the problems and brings about a solution. I thought that's kind of an interesting way of looking at it, isn't it? Think of God Um, loving us very much and think of us especially as we relate to these people filled with all kinds of problems oh you go to the story of Adam and Eve they got problems you hear the story of Abraham has problems you hear the story of Moses leading the children through the desert they got problems You think of David and his problems with somehow getting caught up in sin. You hear the problems of Jeremiah the prophet. Oh my gosh, the people don't listen to the word of God and everything seems to be falling apart. Problems, problems. I don't know about you, but I I think we all have problems, don't we? And it's not just reading about it in the Bible, but it's reading about the Bible and wondering if maybe I can relate somehow to some of these problems that I experience and then try to get a handle on the response that God gives to those problems. I want to share with you just some three problems, three problems, and and, uh, let's examine those problems and see if maybe we can find God entering into our life today in our world with the the answer that we're looking for. Are you looking for answers to your problems? (laughs) Listen listen to this. I think I can give you some, some good directions. I want to tell you the first problem is the problem that happened with the Jewish people about the year 500 before Jesus. The Jewish people got all embroiled in foreign powers coming around and destroying them. Uh, A group of people called the Babylonians from present-day Iraq came and they encircled the whole city of Jerusalem and they held them for over a year hostage, not allowing them to go out and pretty soon Uh, They didn't have food, they didn't have anything, and eventually they were able to break through the walls and they came in and they killed many, many people. And not only did they kill people, but then they started to move to the sacred temple, to the sacred walls that encompassed the city of Jerusalem, and they destroyed them. They destroyed them. They, They took every stone in that great, great place that was the the, the center of worship for the Jewish people, and they destroyed it utterly. And they say that the searching and going for the stones was because of the big fire and there was gold in in the temple. The gold melted, and everybody wanted to get the gold, and so they just flattened the great, great temple, the great place of the presence of God. They, They just totally flattened it. And then after killing many, they took the rest or a great part of the rest, off to slavery, 900 miles away to be slaves. Well, I I hear those stories, and I wonder about that. Here I live in the freedom of the United States, and and, and the freedom that I have as an individual is so very important. And to imagine what it would be like to be 
taken out of my home and taken to a foreign place and then made a slave, made to work and have no rights of my own, a slave. And I would be sitting at night and I'd think about what life was like when I used to be free. And I'd remember my hometown and I'd remember the things that were sacred. But my heart would be broken because as I was walking off to slavery, I looked back and I saw the destruction of everything that was sacred and special to me. And now as I sit here in slavery, the only memory I have is utter destruction and utter hopelessness. Now, <laughs> we're talking about problems, aren't we? And the problems of the Jewish people were very, very real. Everything that they had that was special and, and, and the foundation of their life was taken away. And they were stuck in a foreign land, slaves. Well, when I, when I think about our lives today, I also think that there are many people that can relate to this. Remember the terrible hurricane that came and just devastated the city of New Orleans and Mississippi, Bay St. Louis, Mississippi, and just devastated the place. All of a sudden, things that had been sacred and home were gone, were gone. And I hear about the earthquakes. We here in San Bernardino also have the terrible problem of fires. When the, when the grass gets dry and the brush gets dry, a fire can start and it can just spread. And I've, I've stood from my parish here in San Bernardino and looked up at the mountains and, and known the smoke and the, and the moving fires and the homes of people in my parish that were just totally taken away. You and I know what it is, perhaps not to the same terrible extent of the, of the Jews of being taken off to slavery, but we know what it is to suffer desolation to lose those things that are so very, very vital in our life. Well, okay, problems, problems. Now the question comes, what's God's answer? You know what God answers to these people after they've been slaves for 80 years? They're called out of slavery into freedom, and they're called to come back. But what are they coming back to? Well, it's 80 years later, and all they've heard is stories of the total destruction of the Jerusalem that they loved, the land that they loved. It's all gone. And so talk about discouragement. Oh, my gosh, I got a problem because I don't have a home. I don't have a temple. I don't have anything that can hold me up in my life. And I'm just a mess. I'm just a mess. And then God speaks to them. And I'm going to quote to you from the, from the prophet Isaiah. Listen to God speaking to these Jewish people coming back after the total destruction of their world. Jerusalem, I will speak up for your good. I will never be silent till you are safe and secure, sparkling like a flame. Your great victory will be seen by every nation and king. The Lord will ever give you a new name. And you will be a glorious crown, a royal headband for the Lord your God. Your name will no longer be called deserted or childless, but happily married. You will please the Lord. Your country will be his bride. Your people will take the land just as a young man takes a bride. The Lord will be pleased because of you, just as a husband is pleased with his bride. Oh my gosh, how, how unrealistic, how terrible that God would come and speak of these words of victory and glory, knowing that everything has been destroyed. This is the key to understanding God's response to the problems that we experience in our life. The God we believe in is a God of hope, a God of vision. A God who calls us to see things far beyond what we can ever understand. So if your marriage is broken, and your life is totally, totally out of kilter, if your home is gone, if all of the security you're going, we listen to a God who says, I'm with you, and I call you no matter how much the devastation. 
to greatness. And that's our faith. That's our faith. We believe that God loves us. And even in the total destruction of our life, oh, and it's so hard, but we take those little steps and we walk up to God and say, oh, God, please be my strength, be my power, especially in the devastation of my life. That's the problem. Let me give you another problem. Let me give you another problem. And I'm going to go to the, to the epistles of Paul. And the, the, the problem that I'm going to speak about is a problem that, that occurred in a town called Corinth. It's a town outside the city of Athens in Greek, Greece. It was a uh, very prosperous place at the time of Paul. It actually had, it was like a little isthmus and it had two harbors. And so because of that, they had wealth and goodness and a lot of sin coming in on both sides of the town, making it just very, very affluent. And in the midst of this, uh, in the midst of this world in which it wasn't just affluence, but that there was a great deal of immorality going on, Paul had walked, and with great confidence, even though it seems like an un unlikely place to preach the, the purity and the love of God, he stood before the people and he said, I want to tell you about Jesus Christ and the God that loves you and the God that calls you from where you are to a life of fullness and peace beyond all the sensuality and wealth and power that is so standing out in the world I see today. And you know, people started listening to him. People turned away from the sensuality and they turned away from the wealth and they turned away from the power and they reached out and they started to embrace Christ, the crucified Christ, the loving Christ. And the Holy Spirit came down on this city of Corinth in a mighty way. Oh, we read in the, in the, in the letters, the two letters that Paul wrote to the Corinthians of how the Spirit moved on the people and they were starting to speak in tongues. They had gifts of being able to heal. They could preach, they could teach, they could administer. They were doing all kinds of things. The Spirit of God was just doing great things. Yeah. But there was a problem. <laughs> and this is a problem, I, I think, with most of life. It's kind of like the coin. When you look at one side, but there's the, there's the other side and it's the shadow. And even though they were filled with the Holy Spirit and filled with that, that, that great drive of talents, division started to arise. And they started to become jealous with one another. One wanted to prove that he was better than the other. Uh, I, was, I was baptized by Peter. And the other said, well, I don't care. I was baptized by Cephas. I was, or I was baptized by Paul. No, I was baptized by Apollos. And they were coming up with all kinds of people trying to prove that they were better than everybody else. And they even got into fighting when it came time for communion. They used to have the celebration of the Eucharist, the, the Lord's Supper at a home. And they'd all come together. And those that were rich started getting served before those that were poor. And there was real division between the rich and the poor. You know? Terrible, terrible things. Men and women were coming with, with great division among themselves. Jews and Gentiles. Oh, the problem was very, very acute. And Paul, who had come and brought the good news to them and had been really uh, hoping that this was going to blossom in a great way, had gone back to perhaps Ephesus over, over in Turkey. And he gets the news of this, that this community, great, greatly loved by God, is now having a terrible problem. They can't live together. They're fighting with one another, trying to prove who's better than one another, and all kinds of divisions were coming in. And that was the problem. And so he wrote a letter. And he wrote a letter. And listen, listen to what he says as a, as a pastor, caring for his flock, knowing that the problem now is division. That people are not talking and they're not working together. They're not allowing them the gifts that each has to blossom in good ways. Paul says, this pastor writing a letter, he says, My friends, you ask me about spiritual gifts. I, I want you to remember that before you became followers of the Lord Jesus, you were led in all kinds of wrong ways by idols that can't even talk. Now I want you to know that if you are led by God's Spirit, you will say that Jesus is Lord. And you will never curse Jesus. 
Now he says this, there are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but they all come from the same Spirit. There are different ways to serve the same Lord, and we can each do different things. Yet the same God works in all of us and helps us to do everything that we do. The Spirit has given each of us a special way of serving others. Some of us can speak with wisdom, while others can speak with knowledge. But these gifts come from the same Spirit. <laughs> problems. You might be having problems similar to the Corinthians in your family. Husbands and wives, parents and children, children and parents, great grandparents. You might be having problems in, in your work. There might be great division, and there's people not talking to one another, and people putting other people down in bad situations. You might even be having a problem in your church. There might even be a situation where you, you come to communion every Sunday, and you praise the Lord by listening to the Word, and yet there are people that you don't talk to, people that you you bad mouth and you say all kind of negative things, and there's a real division going on. Whether it's in your family, it's in your work, it's in your school, or your church. We've got to listen to the solution of God. And you know what it is? It's the reminder that you and I, with all of our diversity, have a common bond by being filled with the Holy Spirit. Think about that. You have been blessed by God through baptism, and God has decided to come and live in you. And he lives in you, and he lives in your brother and sister, in your husband, your wife, your children, the people that you work with, the people at your church. And the call of God, the solution that God gives, is the awareness that we ain't the same kind of people that we were, that now we are filled with God's Holy Spirit, and in that Spirit, we got everything it takes to overcome those separations and have the peace and the unity that God wants to give us. That's tough. It's tough to do that, isn't it? It's tough to be able to surrender to God's love for us and to believe that we can be forgiven, that we can be called to a beautiful, beautiful unity with the fellow members of our family, our church, our community. So, I'm coming at you with, with, with two problems. The first is the problem of the Jewish people and the utter, utter destruction of all the physical and spiritual things that they had, the slavery that was theirs, you know, and everything is gone. And God comes back, and God comes with an answer filled with hope and vision and peace. He says, hey, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, here it is, it's all messed up. And he says, hey, you are going to have a new Jerusalem, it's going to come, and God gives us hope. No matter how destroyed we are, that's what we believe. That's what we believe in our hearts. And people can laugh at us and say, oh, get practical. No, but when we have the gift of faith, we can say yes to that. And then there's the problem of the division that we experience in families. And I spoke to you of the town of Corinth. And even though filled with the Holy Spirit and able to manifest things, division came. And God called them to remember that the Spirit is a Spirit that accepts all the gifts and talents of many people and calls us to oneness, to be together. That's the solution of God, the awareness Wait a minute, let me stop and think here. And here I am finding this. Wait a minute. My husband is filled with the Holy Spirit. My children are filled with the Holy Spirit. I am filled with the Holy Spirit. That needs to then, that awareness and that working calls us to that unity. Those people in my parish that speak Spanish when I want to speak English or Vietnamese and oh gosh, they're, they're bothering me. We are all filled with the Spirit, and that Spirit calls us to patience and kindness and a strong driving desire for unity. But now, I want to talk to you about another problem. And the other problem that I'm coming to you with is a little practical problem, and it's the story of, from the Gospel of John, 
Very early in Jesus' ministry, he was called to a wedding feast at Cana in Galilee. Uh, it was a wonderful celebration. Uh, there were the mother of Jesus was there, and Jesus, Jesus and his apostles was, were there. But all of a sudden, a problem arose. Now, it's good to understand, and people have told me this, that a wedding at the time of Jesus was not just a one-day affair that you and I might experience in our culture, but it was something that lasted for a whole week. And so that when parents would be getting ready for their son or their daughter to be having a, a, a wedding, Mm, this took an awful lot of savings, it took an awful lot of money because there had to be food, there had to be wine, there had to be entertainment, and that was an expensive affair. But that was worth it because they loved their son, they loved their daughter, and they were willing to give that. But at this momentous occasion, perhaps in the middle of, the, of, the, of this week's celebration, they ran out of wine. Boo! <laughs> this is chapter 2 in, in the Gospel of John. Well, I like to think of God entering in, not just with the destruction of the temple, not just with the great division that happens with the communities, but God enters in into even the common things that we experience every day. Getting enough food, making sure we have enough clothes, making sure that we can be able to, to live in a house in security, having a job, having all the things that we need on a quiet, continuous basis. And I, I, I see that challenge when I see, I, I hear the story of the wedding feast of Cana. They ran out of wine. It wasn't this monumental thing of the destruction or the division, but a practical thing of running out of wine. And now, you and I can relate to this problem with the solution that God gives. And you know what that is? You know what, what God's solution is? A miracle. God works a miracle and overcomes the problem of no wine. Now, I want you, who are now opening your heart to the love of Jesus in your life, to experience the reality that as you move with God, as you move with Jesus, you need to be open to miracles. God can, can bring wine. <laughs> God can bring work. God can bring healing to our bodies. God can do all those things with miracles. God is a God who creates great visions, whether it's the destruction of Jerusalem, and then we come back to hope. God is a person who calls us to the Holy Spirit, living in us, moving in us in a great way to bring unity and the enhancement of all the gifts we have. And God is a God who works miracles, things that nobody can believe could happen. God does these things and changes the world and turns our lives upside down. I have a very special gift I want to send to you. This is a gift that's rather extraordinary. It's not something that we ordinarily do here in this ministry. It's a beautiful picture of Jesus, painted by the world-famous artist Stanley Gordon. See the handsome, rugged man in this painting with the mesmerizing blue eyes and medium-length beard and most likely an inherited Semitic feature of the slightly olive skin coming from his mother Mary. Look closely into the eyes of Jesus in this painting. You'll see a trusted friend and you'll be touched by a very personal love. This portrait by Stanley Gordon is individually rendered and signed by the artist. That's very significant because there are only limited numbers of these paintings. It's a G-clay reproduction on Torino stretch canvas in a gold frame. Stanley Gordon is a 20th century outstanding artist, one that the world looks to when they want to understand beautiful depictions of the popes, the presidents, and important people of our life. This painting needs to be in your home.
to bless you, to bless the people who are your guests. It becomes a family heirloom. It becomes a gift for the ages. For the price of $2,500, I know that sounds steep, but it's worth it because we're talking about quality, powerful statements of the presence of Christ by a great artist. Please think about this and let us, let us share with you for the blessing of our ministry, this painting by Stanley. This miracle, this, this television program is a miracle in God's power. And I thank you for being part of that miracle and allowing us to continue. One of the joys of, of this program and this ministry is, is listening to your, to your words and, and, and sharing these with others. Oh, and, and you, have, you have so many intentions, and you're writing to me uh, to share your stories, but also to share your needs. And I pledge to you my prayers that God will enter into this. I, I, I got a, a wonderful gift from, from Donald who sent $100, um, and, uh, and he's, he says, thank you for bringing the word in the world to television. I, sure, I, I thoroughly enjoy it. And, and uh, uh, I, 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 I love your simplicity, Father Manning. Uh, you're, you're the real thing. Well, I hope so. I hope so. I, I'm trying to speak to you honestly out of my own heart. Uh, here's a gentleman that was, was walking, walking, wanting to know what he could do to be able to give some money. And uh, he didn't know what to do. And he had $3,000, which is such a great gift. And he said, what am I going to give? Where am I going to give this? And he isn't even Catholic. And suddenly he flicked on television, and there I was sharing my love of God. And he said, well, I guess God says that. And I've got a wonderful check here for $3,000 to help us go. And that really is an important, important way of keeping us going through what we have. A person that was writing from an experience in Japan. And here, um, Father Manning, please accept my donation. Uh, and I, I'm saying thank you for, for being the first person of faith to inspire my awareness with regard to my spiritual connection with God. Thanks for being, oh gosh, thank you very much. We have a web page. It's called, it's called um, um, wordnet.tv, www.wordnet.tv. Um, get in touch. You can blog us. You can let us know what you're thinking, and I'd love to hear that, and we can be able to share with your emails and your letters your love. Thank you, and may Jesus love for you always. Make him smile.